All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to week two, uh, which I will be subtitling as the week where I probably won't get as many people mad at me on the internet as I did last week. Um, and it's still coming because we still got some YouTube shorts from last week's episode that'll be coming out here for the rest of the week. So, um, yeah, there's that. Uh, anyway, uh, again, hopefully uh, I handle things as gent with gentleness and respect, whether you agree with me, whether you disagree with me. I think it is something we should be able to talk about, as is this. You know, it's funny because they always say, um, what are the two things you should never talk about at like family reunions and around the dinner table? Politics and religion, right? Last week we kind of covered a, well, what's both a religious and political issue, and you can't get more religious than this week where we're just covering the different world religions. Now, I will tell you that um, when the question was asked of me, well, I guess I can advance to the next slide so you can see, we are going to be talking about the similarities and differences in the world's major religions tonight. Are we going to be talking about all the world's major religions? No, there is not enough time in the rest of my life to talk about that. Um, and there isn't enough time in like the course of the next week to even talk about all the ones I learned about in seminary. Uh, but when the question was asked, there were five specific, well, four specific ones that were uh, referenced, uh, Judaism, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. And so what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to focus on those religions, but first be, start out by talking about Christianity. Obviously, we won't spend as much time talking about Christianity, but the purpose of what we're going to be doing tonight is kind of a compare and contrast. And so, again, in the course of the next hour or so, obviously we can't have a big, huge, detailed class of uh, comparative religions. So tonight we're going to be talking about specifically five major world religions. I kind of wanted to do a sixth one, I just didn't have time. It wasn't one that was specifically asked of me, but one that is not mentioned up here is, you know, Chinese popular religions. You probably heard of the yin and the yang and feng shui, a feng shui whatever, feng shui and all that kind of stuff. Um, that'd be a worthwhile one to go into as well. Um, it kind of... It's another one that there's just an amalgamation of, of beliefs, but kind of somewhat semi kind of sort of related to Buddhism. Um, but we don't have time, so we're not going to go over that, maybe a future class. Uh, but so what we're going to do is we're going to take these religions one at a time, and I'm going to be answering uh, five questions about each one. And then we can compare the answers that each one gives to each of these five questions. The first one is I'm just going to give what's the main point. If I had to summarize the, the main thrust of this religious worldview in like a single sentence, what would that be to give you the overview? Then we're going to talk about that religion's view of God. How do they think of God? What is their scripture or what is their authority? Uh, are there divisions? What are the various divisions within that worldview? And, of course, what is their view of salvation? All right, and that, so we're going to go through step by step each one of these religions to analyze, answer those five points for each one, because that, I think, will give us a really good way of comparing where we might have some things in common, uh, where we might have some things that differ, and correct, frankly, some misunderstandings that are out there, especially when we get to like Hinduism and Buddhism. There's so much misunderstanding because a lot of these Eastern religions have kind of been we, we borrowed, and the, if you ever heard of New Age philosophy, it borrows from a lot of these Eastern religions, but it uses some of the same terminology, but it mean, they mean completely different things, as we'll see when we get to that. All right, so I don't want to assume that anybody who is here in the room or, or watching this online later uh, necessarily knows the answers to all of these questions about Christianity. And so as our baseline, we'll answer the five questions about Christianity. You do have an outline in front of you, just like last week. And again, there's places on the back if you want to take additional notes. Uh, for purpose of tonight, I didn't have a lot of time to do a whole lot of really, really detailed uh, slides. So the slides are kind of like the, the basic points of the outline. I will occasionally be stepping over here to the whiteboard, my nice, huge, ginormous whiteboard, um, because some of the words I'm going to uh, talk about tonight, there's no way you're going to know how to spell them if you're taking notes, unless I write them down. So <laughs> we'll do some of that for some of them anyway. All right, but for Christianity, what is the main point of Christianity? <laughs> Anybody want to volunteer to read it? I can call on someone. Come on. So, you may have 
thought that, you know, if I was going to give a single verse uh, summary of Christianity, I'd go to John 3.16, which is also a very good verse, obviously, but I didn't because I think this gets, this verse, or verses uh, from Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 get more to the heart of the, um, just the differences that we're going to see between the Christian faith and the other faiths we're going to be talking about tonight. But I mean, what do you have in here? If we were to summarize Christianity, you have, we are saved by grace. Grace is God's free gift. We don't deserve it. We've done nothing to earn it, but God gives it to us anyway. And what is the mechanism through which that happens? Faith. You have faith in, in Christ and his sacrifice on your behalf. And as a result of you having that faith, you get to benefit from God's free gift. All right. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. You do nothing to earn it. You cannot work your way back to reconciling your relationship with God. Through sin, our relationship with God has been severed. We are powerless to do anything about that. It's only because God approaches us that we are able to have that relationship reconciled so that no one can boast. No one can say, yay me, look what I did. I earned my, I earned, earned my, um, earned my salvation. Not the way it works. All right, how do we look at God in the Christian faith? How many gods are there? One. There's one God. That is called monotheism, our first word on the whiteboard for tonight. Here we go. I'll try to write as big as I can on a little whiteboard. Monotheism. I also apologize for the handwriting. M-O-N-O-T-H-E-I-S-M. -O -O -E okay, off to a good start. Monotheism. That is a belief that there is only one God. The first th three religions we will be talking about tonight all share that belief. However, how we describe that one God is very, very different. A lot of people you will hear say, oh, you know, Christians, Jews, and, and, and Muslims all worship the same God. No, we don't. No, we do not. That's kind of like me saying, oh, you, you, you have, you've got a friend named James? i got a friend named James. You must have the same friend just because they have the same name. And then we start talking about our, our friend James, and you, you describe your friend James as being six foot four, and he's an NBA player, and my friend James is actually my pet turtle. All right? It becomes very clear very quickly that even though they have the same name, we're not talking about the same thing, are we? And that's kind of the best analogy I can give you here in response to people who say we all worship the same God. We all worship one God and believe there's only one God, but as you'll see as we work our way through tonight, we describe that God very, very, very differently. All right? In Christianity, God is a trinity. There are three persons within the one single Godhead. Can we wrap our mind around that uh, and understand how that works? No, but we shouldn't expect to because God is God and you are not. God is an infinite being. You are a finite being. The moment you think that you can fully understand everything there is to know about God is the moment you know you have a wrong idea about God. Because if God is so much higher than you, you shouldn't be able to fully understand him. That does not mean you can't understand anything about him. That's going to be a key distinction when we get to Islam. You can understand some things about God. Why? Because you're made in his image. So there are certain attributes of God that we can see in people in humanity, but that does not give us a full understanding of God by any stretch of the imagination. <clears throat> what is our scriptural authority? Well, we have 66 books in the Old and New Testament, right? And we believe those 66 books are the word of God. God inspired the authors. In case that's not I mean, a term maybe you've heard before but never had explained, what does that mean for the Bible to be the inspired word of God? It doesn't mean that God used the authors to take dictation, all right? He didn't literally sit down there and say, okay, Paul, get, get ready to write. Here we go. Repeat after me. I, Paul, I, Paul, think God, think God, is great, is great. No, it didn't work that way, all right? He allows the individual authors to use their individual styles and emphases and their strengths and he works through that. So he's there making sure, essentially, they're covering the topics he wants them to cover. They're not making any mistakes while they're doing it. But if you read all 66 books of the Bible, you're going to see a wide variety in different writing styles. You're going to see poetry. You're going to see history. You're going to see apocalyptic literature. You're going to see proverbs, all right? A lot of different styles. Even within the New Testament, the different authors have different writing styles. <clears throat> all right. And then it gets even more complicated because, like, Paul used a scribe most of the time. So when you read Paul's writings, 
Lots of times he would actually sign them himself at the end. If you're ever reading the Bible and you get to the end of a, um, at the end of a, a, a book of Paul, and all of a sudden you're just reading and it's all in your typewritten Bible, right? And you're like, all of a sudden it says something along the lines of, and now I, Paul, here, affix my own name or in my own hand say this. Of course, you don't see handwriting, so it means nothing to you. It's all typewritten. But what that was, was he would have someone else would be writing for him, and, and he would basically be dictating what to write. And then at the end, he would actually use his own handwriting so people knew this really was a letter from him. All right, and just write that. <clears throat> but as a result, it was almost a collaborative process where the ultimate ideas might have come from Paul, but whoever his scribe was might have some suggestions on style, on wording, things like that. So sometimes if you have different scribes, you might have slightly different writing styles, but the content you can still recognize as definitely being from Paul. All right, divisions, we've had a lot, haven't we? Um, some of the big ones, to, to, again, there are many, many more before these and afterwards on smaller scale, but the first, what's called the Great Schism, a lot of people, we, especially we Lutherans, you know, we think, like, uh, oh, we just automatically go to the Protestant Reformation. No, how about we go about 500 years before that, folks? Um, the, in 1054 AD, you had uh, the church in Rome and the church in Constantinople. They didn't get along. They didn't agree on a bunch of stuff, things like whether you could, I mean, some silly things. Can you use unleavened bread or leavened bread in communion? What is appropriate to do? Um, <clears throat> uh, other things in there, like the, some wording of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, we say the Apostles' Creed, you know, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, right? That, those three words, and the Son, um, you can quiz Carter on this, see if he still remembers from last year. Uh, it's called the Filioque. You want to know how to spell that? It's not important. There's not going to be a test later, but in case you really want to know, that is F-I-L-I-O-Q-U-E. Filioque. It just means and the sun. And there's a big dispute between the Eastern Church and the Western Church about whether the Holy Spirit just proceeds from the Father or proceeds from the Father and the Son. So your Eastern churches, which then became the Orthodox Church, you look at their Apostles' Creed even to this day, it does not say and the Son. They don't have the Filioque in their Apostles' Creed. The Western Church does have the Filioque in their Apostles' Creed. So that was one of the disputes that actually led to the Great Schism, where those two churches broke apart, and so you had the church in the West in Rome, and the church in the East based in Constantinople, still exists today, Roman Catholic Church, and the Orthodox Church. Of course, there's been more divisions on each side since then, including 1517 A.D. What happened in 1517 A.D.? Martin Luther, yeah. And I would like to say that I think everybody in the congregation, including me, gets a failing grade because when I was preaching on um, Reformation Sunday last year, I was going to edit the sermon at the end and I was talking about, at least what I was supposed to be saying, was 1517 AD is when Martin Luther went and nailed his 95 theses to the, the, the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. And I, I, I I was taking out the 11 o'clock sermon, it's what I usually pull out, and I saw that I said, in 1917, I asked, what, to hap what happened in 1917? That's okay, I'm a video editor, right? I can just go pull the audio from the 9 o'clock service and just put that over the, the, the video in the 11 o'clock service. Guess what I said to the 9 o'clock service? <laughs> so, being the brilliant video editor that I am, I found some other word where I'd made that fifth sound, and I pulled that out. So if you go and watch just the sermon video now, it will, I say 1517 in that sermon video. But if you go watch the, either one of the services, you will see I say 1917 in both of them. And nobody called me on it. I mean, some people were looking at me cross-eyed when I was asking what happened in, on October 31st, 1917. Um, I was wondering why I was having a hard time getting an answer. That was why. Um, anyway, so yeah, so 1517, Martin Luther posts his 95 Theses. Starts out as a dispute basically over indulgences and some other things, and it grows uh, into issues with the authority of the Pope, um, the role of works in Catholic salvation, the accessibility of the scriptures, that the ability of just, a, we take for granted that we have a Bible that we can read. That was not the case before Martin Luther. The laity did not get to read the scriptures and have your own copy of the Bible. It was written in Latin. Most people didn't even speak Latin, all right? So 
that was another big division. And of course, after that, after uh, Luther kind of got the ball rolling, we saw a whole bunch of other divisions come hot in its coattails, where 1525, you had the Anabaptist movement, which, which was, you know, infant baptism. No, they didn't like that, one adult believer's baptism. So that kind of broke off. 1533, King Henry VIII uh, took all the churches that were in England and split them off from the Roman Catholic Church. And they, not having an originality whatsoever in what to name their church, just called it the Church of England. And then, of course, after that, you have John Calvin and the, the Calvinist uh, and the Presbyterianism comes off of that. So all in the 1500s, you see this, this split uh, that starts with Luther, and then with all those church, within those churches that split off, even more divisions. So we've got a lot of different splits within the Christian church as well. And then we already talked about kind of what the, the view, the Christian view of salvation is. It's the fact that we are all fallen. We have sinned. That sin has separated us and broken our relationship with God. We are powerless to get back and restore that ourselves. So God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to atone for our sins, what we call the atonement. He basically pays the price for our sins. He rises from the dead. He conquers death, so death is no longer an obstacle. And if we have faith in him, then we have that, his, his uh, sacrifice is applied to us. So when we face judgment, instead of God looking at us and seeing all of our sin, he sees Jesus' perfection. And Jesus' perfection gets applied to us, so we look squeaky clean. All right? And then, of course, are we really squeaky clean? No. So even though Jesus' perfection is applied to you when you have faith, all right, then God actually sends the Holy Spirit to live inside of you and starts the process of cleaning you up for real. And that's what we do throughout the rest of our life in a process called sanctification, where we are slowly becoming more and more like Christ because of the work of the Holy Spirit within us. All right. That all should look pretty familiar, okay, if you've ever been to Bible study before. Now let's get wacky. All right. Here's one you probably think you know a lot about. I'm going to erase this just so we're ready. We're going one religion at a time with the whiteboard. All right. It's a small whiteboard. What's that? Yeah. Well, I, this was an afterthought because I just didn't have time to do the slides. And that whiteboard is what we use when we used to do pre-service hosts. You know, we would hold, anybody ever watch the pre-service hosts, you ever say hello online? They didn't have it in front of them. We'd write down the name of whoever the heck just said hi online and hold it underneath the camera with that whiteboard. That's how they knew who said it. High tech stuff, ladies and gentlemen. We spare no expense. All right. Judaism. You may think because you've been a whole bunch of Bible studies and you understand, you've, maybe you even sat through my Hebrews Bible study this time last year and you think, I, you know what, Ken, I'm good on this one because I was in your Hebrews Bible study. We learned so much about that Old Testament Judaism. I know everything there is to know about Judaism. You don't know squat about Judaism, or at least about modern Judaism, because modern-day Judaism is a very different creature for one very important reason, and I'm wondering if anybody's going to figure it out before we get there. Why modern-day Judaism looks very, very different from what it did before because of one particular historical event that made them have to change. It happened in 70 AD. That's the only hint I'm going to give you. And we'll see if we get there. All right. So let's talk about Judaism. All right. Judaism is both a group and a religion. All right. So you have people that are considered Jews that may not have any faith in God whatsoever. All right? They are cultural Jews. They are, you know, they're Jews by birth. All right? It's an eth ethnicity, right? but it is also a religion. Now, it used to be, back in the days of the Old Testament, that the way you determined whether someone was Jewish or not was by their father. So if their father was Jewish, then they were considered Jewish, even if they had a non-Jewish mother. That is no longer the case. And I'm not sure when it switched over, to be honest with you, but now Judaism is matrilineal meaning that they look to see if your mother is Jewish, then you are considered Jewish, even if you have a non-Jewish father. You can, and that's, as a practical matter, right, you always know who the mom is, you don't necessarily know who the dad is, right? Um, yeah, I've got, I've got two dogs, both of which are husky mixes, and the only way we could tell one of them is a husky mix is because, well, mom was a husky, and you could tell mom. But dad clearly was not, okay, I'll just say that, was not a husky. Um, all right, so it, it, it's a matrilineal, except for one exception. There's one way that you can have a mother be Jewish and you still not be considered Jewish. Anyone want to hazard a guess what it is? <laughs> BA's got it. 
if you believe Jesus is the Messiah. If you believe Jesus is the Messiah, you are not Jewish in their eyes. So, yet, yeah, are there such things as Messianic Jews? Yes, there are. Does the rest of the Jewish community believe they're Jewish? No. No, they do not. Doesn't matter who your mom is. So the irony of it is, you can be atheist and be considered to be Jewish, but you cannot be Christian and be considered to be Jewish. Um, and there's a long history behind that, obviously, uh, not just from the first century, but, I mean, let's face it, there were many times in history where, when Christianity did come to political power, that they were not kind to Jews, all right? Even Trump, culturally? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you're, if, you, if you are just persona non grata at that point, um, if, you, if you are, except Jesus as the Messiah. <clears throat> all right. What is the main point? If I were to sum up Judaism as one point, modern Judaism now, we're not talking Old Testament Judaism, modern day Judaism, it would be this. Doctrine, meaning what you believe, is not as important as behavior. Modern day Judaism is focused on how you behave in this life. That is the top priority. All right. What is their view of God? Well, you should recognize this from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is, like I said, from the book of Deuteronomy, and Jews call this the Shema. Shema is just from the Hebrew meaning hear. It's based on the first word, right? Hear. Uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is the most fundamental declaration of the Jewish faith, which says there is one God and only one God. Now, what's interesting about this is the Hebrew in uh, this particular verse for one, our Lord is one, actually can include pluralities within the one. For example, you see it used in other, um, other contexts such as, you know, a, a, a man shall be united to a woman and they will be one flesh. Well, there's two things right there, man to woman, but they are seen as making up one flesh. Uh, a, a night and day make up one day. Um, and so the particular Hebrew word that's used here does allow for that, at least. But most of the times, modern-day Jews will not use that word anymore to describe God. Why? Largely in reaction to Christianity, right? And so they will use another, another Hebrew word that really does specifically just mean one, only one, no room for any kind of plurality within that. Um, so a lot of what you see here actually was a response and has grown out of response to Christianity. Um, so they do not believe in the Trinity, uh, the Trinity in their mind would be to say there's more than one God, all right, and they do not believe that. Um, are there divisions within Judaism? Yes, all right. Um, there are three basic divisions within Judaism, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform. Not Reformed, Reform, all right. These are your basic, your three levels of modern Judaism. Now, there are divisions within each. Again, we're kind of talking on the most general level, right? but even within each of these, there are subdivisions. All right. <clears throat> and basically, what differentiates them is how much they prioritize obeying the Jewish law versus how much they're willing to let modern culture influence them. On the high end, you've got the Orthodox Jews, who they are all... This is the strictest of the strict. Right? We have to obey the law. God's law takes priority almost to the point of trying to shut the door on any cultural influence upon them in their lives whatsoever. And then the opposite side of things is you've got the Reformed Jews who, as we'll talk about in a minute when we talk about their authority, they actually kind of look at the scriptures as maybe folk tales. So they don't even consider the law as important. I mean, there's some good advice in folklore, right? And, and so they allow themselves to be influenced much more by modern culture. And of course, your conservative Judaism is in the middle. Conservative is not a political comment. It's conservative in the sense of they want to conserve as much of the Old Testament Jewish law as they can while still acknowledging that we live in a different society, in a different culture. So they kind of try to walk the, the, the tightrope between the two extremes, if you would say that. That is the biggest... Um, of these three divisions, at least in the United States, and maybe in the world, worldwide, that's the biggest category of the three. All right. What is Jewish scripture? Well, you may think you know the answer to this one as well. What do we all think of when we think of Jewish scriptures? First five the, the first five books of the Bible. Anything else? How about the whole Old Testament? 
I mean, the whole Old Testament, right? The, the, the Torah, right, is what we, so what we, we think of kind of all the Old Testament is the, the Jewish scriptures. And for us, all scripture is kind of on equal footing, right? So every, all scripture is God-breathed, as, as Paul says in First or Second Timothy. I always forget which one that is. Um, <clears throat> so all of it is kind of an equal footing, all equally divinely inspired by God, including all the books of the Old Testament. Not so, so much in modern-day Judaism, all right? First of all, they do, it, it, it's going to depend on which of these groups you fall under, all right, about how, how you regard the, the scriptures. Um, but the Jewish Bible does ge- generally consist of all the same books that we have in the Old Testament, but not necessarily in the same order, and their verses, markings, and everything are going to be different. But they take those books of the Old Testament and they divide them up into three categories. They have an, an acronym called the Tanakh. Here we go, walking over to the whiteboard. Here we All right, Tanakh. And again, if I get any of the pronunciations wrong this evening, you have my wholehearted apologies. I will do my best. <clears throat> Tanakh is actually, like I said, it's an acronym for the three sections of the Bible. The first section of the Bible is the first five books. The books of Moses, the Pentateuch, or the word that contributes to this, I've already heard once tonight, starts with a T, and it would be? Torah. Torah, right. So you have the Torah, which is the first five books. All right, the books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All right? The second section are all the prophets. Now, we divide those up into major prophets and minor prophets. They lump them all together as just the prophets. Anyone want to hazard a guess on this one? No, we don't, we don't, we don't hear much about other than the, the Torah, right? The next section would be called, and again, I believe I'm pronouncing it at least close to it, Nevi'im. Nevi'im. So N-E-V-I apostrophe I-M. Nevi'im. All right, that's all of your, uh, your prophets, all right? Then everything else that's in our Old Testament, they call writings, just writings, all right? And again, the Jewish word for that would be ketu- ketuvim. Ketuvim. But just think of this as, you know, the books of Moses, the prophets, and the writings, which is catch-all for everything else, all right? Those are the three categories of the Jewish Bible. Now, within those, let's talk about Orthodox uh, Jews, which are, again, the strictest ones that most adhere to the law. For them, the Torah, they would regard the Torah basically the same way we regard the whole Bible. This is the divinely inspired word of God, highest priority. Then the prophets are still important, but a step below the Torah, and the writings, again, still important, but a step below the prophets. All right, so it's kind of a tiered system of authority within the Old Testament books. <clears throat> all right, that is all the Tanakh. That is not their only scripture. In addition to the Tanakh, the Jews have another collection that also starts with a T. I won't make you guess it, but you've probably heard it before. The Talmud. Anybody ever heard of the Jewish Talmud? It's right there on the board. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The Jewish Talmud actually has two parts in itself, and I'm running out of room on the board, but we'll see if I can get them on here. Within the Jewish Talmud, there's two parts. There's what's called the Mishnah. Mish. Ah, I misspelled. Mishnah and Gemara. All right. <laughs> it's a lot like Gomorrah, but it, it predates Gomorrah. Um, so the, the Mishnah is a collection of commentaries on the Jewish law. So you've got, just like you might pick up a Bible commentary, right? They've got a bunch of historical commentaries written by rabbis over the years that are commenting on the law, all right? And then the uh, Gemara, which I, I believe every time I've seen it referred to, it's just referred to as Gemara, not the Gemara, um, 
that just anecdotal, I may be right or may be wrong about that. That's kind of stories, dialogues, illustrations of the law. So if you think about it, the Mishnah is kind of your philosophical conversation, discussions about the law, your, your scholarly discussions about the law, and the Gemara, or Gemara is, here's how you practically apply it. Let me give you some illustrations so you can practically see how this lives out in your life. Now, even though this isn't, you know, the Tanakh, a lot of um, Orthodox Jews especially almost kind of hold the Talmud in higher authority and regard than they do the Tanakh because this is what they love to sit around. I, I used to have a, a Jewish friend I used to work with and he would have a group that got together once a month and they have a little, um, little worship thing down in the, the basement of our office building and then they would kind of sit around and they would talk through all of the, these, these writings from the Mishnah you know, and they would be discussing them back and forth. So that, that's really what they, they love to focus on that. All right, <clears throat> and last, the view of salvation. Remember what I told you before, modern day Judaism is really focused on um, just, is, is focused on how you live your life today. Well, there's a very practical reason for that. Because in AD 70, the temple was destroyed. Remember, everything we read in the Old Testament talks about all these laws about making sacrifices. And we saw, if you were in the Hebrews class, how this Old Testament sacrificial system pointed toward Jesus' sacrifice. Well, what do you do if your entire world is based upon sacrifice and now you can't make them anymore because the temple's destroyed? Well, what's really kind of interesting is you had these two groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. You've heard of them before, right? The Sadducees, most priests were Sadducees. And so the Sadducees were the ones that were making those sacrifices. And so when the temple was destroyed, the Sadducees were out of work. They had nothing to do. Well, the Pharisees were all the legalistic ones. So whenever you hear Jesus getting mad at people for being overly legalistic, he's yelling at the Pharisees, all right? And there weren't as many of them, but they seized an opportunity. Because now there's no temple anymore, so the Sadducees don't have any power, and so the Pharisees swoop in and say, okay, from now on, we're going to focus on the law. We don't have a temple anymore, we can't focus on sacrifice, so let's focus on the law. And so Judaism became a religion of obedience to God's law which led to it being focused, again, on how you're living your day-to-day -day life in obedience to the law and not so much on sacrifice. Well, as that grew over time, there were some implications of that, all right? <clears throat> For example, the whole idea of sin kind of fell by the wayside. Um, Jews came to have kind of an opposite view of humanity, the nature of humanity than we as Christians do, where they say, yeah, we're not perfect, but by and large, we're pretty good, and we have the ability to freely choose a good or evil, but most of the time we're going to choose good. And why? Because they don't have that means anymore to atone for their sins. They don't have the sacrificial system. And so they want to kind of minimize the role that sin plays because they don't have the same method to pay for it anymore. But there's still some sin, and there's differences of opinion on how you pay for it. Uh, but the most common view is that basically the way you pay for sins or have your sins atoned for. You don't need any sacrifices anymore, anything like that. You need to go out and do some good deeds. You need to repent and say you're sorry and need to pray. If you do those things, you basically, you're, you're really sorry about it, you pray about it, and you do it in good deeds, you can do enough good deeds to basically to offset the bad stuff you did when you sinned. All right, that's your, your summary of modern day Judaism. All right, um, I did spend a good amount of time on that one because I know there's probably a good number of misunderstandings and we think we know Judaism and we don't. So we are going to go a little bit faster through these others, but here's where we start getting, as we go through these, we're going to get further and further away from Christianity and, and what you're, you're used to understanding. So the next one we're going to talk about is Islam. All right, Islam, also monotheistic, which we'll talk about in a second. But if I were to give the main point for Islam, it is submit to Allah. Islam means submission. A Muslim is someone who submits. So the main point of Islam is not love and reconciliation like Christianity. It's just submission. Your job is to submit to Allah's will. All right? Now, I got my pages out of order here. Here we go. All right. Sometimes people hear Allah and they think that that's like the, the Islamic name for God. It's not Allah. It's just Arabic for God. It's just, that just, that's the word God. It's just they like to talk in Arabic, so they say Allah. Uh, but it, it means God, the same thing. All right, <clears throat> their view of God, God is absolutely one. There is no division within God. God is not a trinity. As a matter of fact, to call God a trinity is what they call shirk, S-H-I-R-K. 
I don't need to write it down, but I will erase this while I'm thinking of it. Um, shirk is the most serious and egregious types of sin you could have in the Islamic religion. So there is nothing worse than basically saying God is a trinity, according to Islam. The other thing you need to know about God, according to Islam, is you cannot know anything about him. God is so transcendent, so far above us, he is completely unknowable. Very different from what Christianity teaches, that you can actually not only know him, but have a relationship with him. He wants to reach out to you. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. That concept is completely foreign in Islam. What you can know is what his will is. You can't know who he is, but you can know what he wants of you. And the only reason you know what he wants of you is because it's recorded in the Quran. All right? That's what the Quran is. <clears throat> the Quran is about two-thirds the length of the New Testament. And supposedly where it comes from is in 622 AD, the angel Gabriel dictated it to Muhammad. Now, Muhammad didn't write it down, but he went out and he told people about it. And supposedly his followers, after his death, wrote it down. Okay, supposedly. I say supposedly because quite early on in the history of Islam, there were already some very, very different versions of the Quran going out there. And so the, the, the third caliph, of, um, which is like the head of uh, Islam, actually said, we need to have one authoritative version. So we're going to have one authoritative version. We made this up and ordered that every other manuscript be burned and destroyed. And so it, that's called destruction of evidence, by the way, in modern, modern lingo, if you want to know. But yeah, so, but they, they allegedly wrote down what Muhammad told him, so that's how we have the record of what Gabriel supposedly told to Muhammad. All right, the Quran is not their only scripture. They also, what's, called, what's known as Hadith, Hadith is kind of like the Mishnah is in Judaism. Hadith is a series of stories, illustrations, comment, or commentaries, more so, on, um, on the Quran and, and on God's will. Um, again, that comes underneath the Quran in the grand scheme of things. But you have the Quran, their holy scriptures, and the Hadith, which kind of explains those scriptures more and applies them to their lives. Um, there are divisions within Islam. I was um, listening to somebody a while ago who was a Muslim, I mean, I wasn't talking, it was a video I was watching, I wasn't talking personally, and they were criticizing Christianity for saying about all the denominations and all the divisions within Christianity, and you just want to say, you know, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, right? Um, there are just as many divisions within Islam. Um, I don't know, I haven't counted them up, but there's a lot, right? And it all started right after Muhammad died, all right? So Muhammad dies... And his son-in-law comes up and says, I, but by the way, everybody, I know I didn't tell you this beforehand, but take my word for it. Before Muhammad died, he said he wanted me to succeed him. Well, the vast majority of Muslims didn't buy that and didn't want uh, Muhammad's son-in-law to be the next caliph. And so instead they chose Muhammad's father-in-law. And then there was a, a split which survives to this day, and you've probably heard the differences between Shiite and Sunni Muslims. That's what, that goes all the way back to right after Muhammad died. And then, of course, over the years within that, there's been more and more divisions even within the Shiite and Sunni communities. <clears throat> so yes, there are differences, and largely the differences of opinion within Islam stem from just that, you know, who's a legitimate leader of Islam, if you want to say. There are things about the, the proper interpretation of jihad. You know, most Muslims will say jihad refers to an internal uh, struggle that people are, are going through. Obviously, there are branches of Islam that say no. It's, it means you have to go out and kill anybody who doesn't agree with, uh, with Islam, you know. So that's kind of some of the, the, the differences of opinion they have within that. All right. What is their view of salvation? This is where I kind of want to spend the most time on each one because this is where we really see the differences between them. All right. At the end of time, Muslims believe that God, Allah, will judge everyone. And he's going to judge them based upon whether they did good deeds or not, and whether they followed what are called the five pillars of Islam, which I will tell you what those are in just a second, all right? And I'll write them on the board, all right? Five pillars of Islam. But here's the thing. Remember, you can't know God. You can't know Allah. You can only know his will. There is no such thing in Islam as being assured of your salvation. None. 
you because you don't know. I mean, Allah's will is, is sovereign. It is supreme. It, takes, it overrides everything. So all you can do is you do as many good deeds as you can. You try to follow the five pillars as best you can. And you just hope it's enough. And you don't find out until you die. All right? Welcome to Islam. Now, what are the five pillars? All right. Five pillars of Islam. Number one, confession or the confession of faith. I'm just going to write confession on here. But let's call it the confession of faith. It's a particular statement you have to make. All right? <clears throat> um, you have to say there's no God but the one God. There's no God but Allah. And Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, you have to declare that. You have to mean it when you say it. Like, I didn't just become a Muslim just because I said it, okay? Uh, you have to mean I don't mean it. <laughs> just, but you have to mean it when you say it. And you have to keep with it throughout your entire life. All right, so if at any point you ever disavow it, you're not a Muslim anymore. And you haven't followed the first of the five pillars. The second pillar of Islam is prayer. Now, this is not just any old prayer. Muslims have very specific prayers they have to say word for word five times a day at specific times of the day. And they have to be facing Mecca, which is the holiest site in Islam, all right, when they're doing it, and there are certain postures they have to be doing. And when I say word for word, understand, these are prayers that are said in Arabic. You may not even understand Arabic. It doesn't matter. You have to say the prayer in Arabic. So you literally may have no idea what you're saying. It doesn't matter. The importance is Allah's will. Allah says do it. You do it exactly as he says to do it. All right? Number three is almsgiving. That's not thanksgiving. There is no turkey involved. Come on. It's, uh, think of it like tithing, all right? Giving alms is giving charity. It's 2.5% of your net worth, basically. So it's not just your, uh, your income, like we think of a tithe. It's whatever your net worth is, you have to give 2.5% of it to people in need or for the spread of Islam, all right? For the furtherance of Islam. All right, number four is fasting, or we could call it alleged fasting. Every year during the month of Ramadan, which follows a lunar calendar, so it actually gets like 10 to 12 days earlier every year, so that's why Ramadan's always kind of moving throughout the year, uh, our solar year, our solar calendar. Um, but during the month of Ramadan, you have to fast. Well, what does fasting mean? That means during daylight hours, you cannot let anything pass your lips. No food, no drink. You also are not allowed to engage in sexual intercourse, even if you're married, during daylight hours, during Ramadan. The key word here is during daylight hours. What do you think happens when the sun goes down? It's Mardi Gras, people! As a matter of fact, in Muslim countries, there is more consumption overall during the month of Ramadan than there is any other month of the year because it's party time at night, okay? <clears throat> yes, but you have to do that. And this is actually supposed to be commemorating Gabriel um, dictating the Quran to Muhammad. And remember what the purpose of Ramadan is. That's what it is. All right, and number five is the pilgrimage. At least once during your lifetime, as long as you are physically able and financially able, you have to take a trip to Mecca. This is not a vacation trip, all right? It's not, yay, we're going to go stay at the Four Seasons Mecca. No. There are specific things you have to do. For example, everybody that's on this pilgrimage, they're all, there's these same kind of all white outfits that they wear. It's meant to show equality of everyone in the eyes of Allah, all right? And there's activities you have to do when you're there. Like you have to, at one point, walk seven times around the Kaaba. I'm not going to spell that one. You want to write down, write the big black rock. All right? That's what the Kaaba is. It's the big black rock. It's considered a temple. There's a big black rock in Mecca, which um, Muhammad says is the, the location where Adam and Abraham both worshipped God. 
That's the allegation. Any evidence to support it? No, but it's a nice looking rock. All right, and it's big. And so you gotta walk around it seven times and things like that. <clears throat> All right. So they do believe in Abraham. They do. Now, they changed the story a bit. All right. Muslims believe essentially the chosen one was Ishmael, not Isaac. So they have all of these same stories, but they almost kind of reverse Ishmael and Isaac and say they're defended, descended through Ishmael. You know? But yeah, that's why they're called. All three of these religions are called Abrahamic religions because all three, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, supposedly trace their roots back to Abraham. Okay? So you, you live your life according to the five pillars. You do as many good deeds as you, you, you can, and you hope for the best. That's Islam. All right? Moving on. Hinduism. Now it really gets wackadoo. All right? I'm going to do my best in a short period of time to explain as best I can, but this is going to seem completely foreign to a lot of you. At least with, with Christianity and Judaism and, and Islam, they kind of belong to the same intellectual family. I want you to take your brain, put it over here, and leave it aside for a second, because I'm going to have you think a completely different way when it comes to Hinduism and Buddhism. All right? The good news is if you start to understand Hinduism, Buddhism is an outstretch from it. So you'll probably be good for the next one. All right. What is the, the main point of Hinduism? I would say the ultimate goal of life is to achieve moksha. Moksha is the release from the cycle of birth, left, life, death, and rebirth, also known as reincarnation. Yes, we're going to start talking about reincarnation. <clears throat> All right, so what is the Hindu view of God? Depends which Hindu you talk to. All right. Um, as you'll see here in a minute, Hinduism is not really one religion. Hinduism is a plethora of countless religions that all, it's kind of like an umbrella that covers a bunch of different religions. As a matter of fact, the word Hinduism just means the religion of India. It was actually coined by Westerners um, to describe the religion of India. All right. And we'll talk about what those unifying themes are, but you can have Hindus that believe in one God, uh, monotheism, like we saw. You can have Hindus who believe in many gods, polytheism. You can have Hindus who believe in no god. You can have Hindus who believe that nature is God. All right? So there's all sorts of varieties of beliefs about God that you can have in Hinduism because when we talk about what those unifying factors are, a belief in a particular type of God is not one of the unifying factors that defines what it means to be Hindu. What is their authority? Well, here's where we do get our first unifying factor. All right, and that is the Vedas, the Vedas. Back in around um, uh, 1500 BC, the, uh, the, the Indian subcontinent was basically invaded by a group called the Aryans. All right? And the Aryans brought with them a number of stories. And these stories were written down in what's called the Vedas. So the Vedas are these earliest Hindu scriptures. And it's these stories that they're based on, you know, about all the gods, Vishnu, you've probably heard of all these, all these stories of these Hindu gods. No matter what branch of Hinduism you fall under, you have to revere the Vedas. The Vedas have to be your, one of your primary scriptures, your authorities, all right? So that is the first unifying factor that defines what it means to be a Hindu. <clears throat> now, beyond that, there are other types of scriptures as well. All right? I won't go into all of them, but they are basically different types of scriptures that some branches of Hinduism follow, other branches might not, and we'll talk maybe a little bit about some of those as we talk about the divisions are. Um, but the Vedas are the number one. They're, they're the top one. Yeah, you've got the, the Brahmanas, which is, this is what, the kind of regulations for priests. So this is what the priests in Hinduism would follow. Suras are kind of like commentaries, stinky stuff. All right, Upanishads, also kind of more thinky stuff. The suras are more to apply to everybody, like how to, um, how to live your life, practical stuff. The Upanishads are philosophy kind of stuff, and we'll, we will talk a little bit more about those in a second. <clears throat> Divisions within Hinduism. How much time you got? Um, there's so many estimates, nobody really knows. There's so many different branches within Hinduism, they really can't be counted. However, we can probably categorize them by three paths. There are three different ways people are trying to make their next life better than their last one, all right? Uh, remember, it's all based on reincarnation. And the idea is 
you want to work your way up the reincarnation ladder until eventually you get to moksha, which we'll talk more about what moksha is in a second. All right? But you can be reincarnated <clears throat> as a higher level of human because they do believe in the caste system, which is another essential element of, believing, of being a Hindu. To be a Hindu, you have to believe in the caste system. Um, we'll elaborate on that in a second. You can be reincarnated as an animal. You can be reincarnated as a plant. Who wants to be poison ivy in your next life? I wonder what you have to do to earn that, all right? <clears throat> and the way this works is everybody has a soul, what they call an Atman. All right, this one I will write down. Ah, after I break the, uh, no wait, I didn't break it. Tom, I didn't break, this is not, this is totally not your, uh, your, 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 your tripod at all. All right. <laughs> all right, your soul is called your Atman or Atman, kind of like Batman, but without the B. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Everybody has a soul. Now, throughout your life, you're doing good deeds, you're doing bad deeds, or whatever, and it starts with a K. What word am I going to write? Karma attaches itself to your Atman. All right. Now, there's good karma and there's bad karma. If you do good stuff, good karma, good karma latches onto your soul. If you do bad stuff, bad karma latches onto your soul. And then at the end of your life, you look at your karmic balance between the two, and that determines what your next life is going to be. So, contrary to what you'll hear in the West, karma does not mean if you do something bad in this life, it's going to come back to haunt you later. That is a Western concept that is not karma according to Hinduism or Buddhism, all right? Excuse me. So, that is, your whole life is trying to get more good karma than bad karma, and there are three ways you can go about doing that, that you can try to get good karma. There is the way of works, the way of knowledge, and the way of devotion, all right? The way of works. The way it works, this is what's practiced by the priests, all right? Remember I said there are, um, there's a caste system within Hinduism. At the top level, um, I'm not going to give you the, the Hindu words for them because, well, they're complicated and they spell, spell weird. But your, your top level are your priests, all right? This is the highest caste. This, if you're a priest, you're probably going to achieve moksha after this life. You're in good shape, all right? Below that is what used to be considered the warrior class, but now is frankly, don't laugh, politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? These are your people, I'm using that word kind of broadly, but these are people that are, have your political power. All right, so not priests, but this is kind of your second highest class. Next one is your merchants. Merchants can be business owners, they can be landowners, all right? That's your next level, all right? You wanna be in one of these three castes. These are the good castes to be in, all right? Then you get to, did I miss one? Hold on, priest. Now, then you get to the, the laborers. All right. The laborers actually don't even, the top three categories, these are the ones that are really actively participating in most of your Hindu rituals and things like that. The laborers exist to serve the top three castes. That's it. Those are your castes. However, there is actually another group. And there's, that group actually outnumbers all three of these top castes combined. And we will call them the untouchables. And I'm going to draw a line here. Because according to Hinduism, the untouchables aren't even considered a caste. They're considered outside the caste system. But like I said, there are more people in this category than the top three combined. These are actually considered like non-people. These are the ones you see living in the slums. All right? Why do they have so many slums? Because remember what Hinduism teaches. If they're in that caste, it's because they're paying for something they did in a past life. So if you help, them, you want to know why Mother Teresa got so much pushback? This is why. Because if you help them, then they're not 
paying the penalty they have to pay. And so you're actually hurting them because they're going to come back in a low caste again for the next life. So Hindus would say the best thing you can do for them is let them suffer. Because that way, in the next life, they'll move up the karmic ladder. That's a bit foreign concept to what we think of here, isn't it? They're untouchable, and you can't help them. How do they, re- how do they move up? By get going through the whole life of suffering. And then they, they basically paid for their, their bad karma from the past life, and so now they can be reincarnated at a higher... I mean, maybe just as a laborer, but they can move their way up. Sure. What's that? You could be, it depends on how you, I mean, if you do a lot of bad deeds while an untouchable, you still have to live a good life, and you still have to follow one of these paths, and we'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> all right, so the, the one path, the way of works, is what's done by the priests, all right, and that is where you have certain religious rituals, practices, things that they go through, and that you live your life performing these various different rituals, all right? You do the rituals, you get good karma attached to you, you achieve moksha, ta-da, yay you. All right? But that is just for the priests. All right? The way of knowledge is only available to, I mean, priests could do it, but it's only available to the top three castes. All right? And the way of knowledge is where you basically study the Upanishads. All right? Remember I told you this other secondary level of scripture? And the purpose of your study, you spend your whole life studying them to gain knowledge. Gain knowledge about the truth of reality. And here's what that reality is. You think you're an individual person? and you're sitting next to other individual people? No, you're not. Everything you see in life is an illusion, or what they call maya, M-A-Y-A, all right, for illusion. The truth about the, re- the, the world is there's only one. All, all is one, all right? And that one is called Brahman. This universal oneness, B-R-A-H-M-A-N, Brahman. So you will hear in Hindu circles the phrase, Atman is Brahman. Your soul is ultimately just this universal oneness. Think of it like a drop of water falling into a lake. It falls into a lake, is there any more drop of water? No, it's just part of that one lake, right? That's the nature of reality according to Hinduism. We all think we're individual drops of water, we're really not. And so you, this is what the, the way of knowledge does to try to get you to gain this knowledge and study these scriptures to learn that and to internalize that. And that's how you get good karma attached to you. All right? And the last way is the way of devotion. All right? The way of devotion is available to pretty much anybody. And this is what you see when you, when you think of the typical polytheistic uh, Hinduism with all the idols, the idol worshiping and things like that. At this point, you pick a god. Pick a god, any god, like pick a card, any card, right? Pick a god, any god, and you're going to spend your life in devotion to that god. And there's any number of them. There's some favorites out there, you know, but you can pick a god, any god, and they think the gods actually reside in these statues. So the the idol isn't the god per se, but the god lives in the idol. And so you have to then take care of that idol, all right? And they will dress it up. They will wash it. It'll be spot. Their whole house may be a pigsty, but that idol looks spectacular. They will put food offerings out to feed the idol. Everything. Why? Because by doing that, you get good karma to help yourself move up the ladder. But wait a minute. If we're all an illusion, then none of that exists. But you don't know that yet. Remember, this is for the lower caste. You don't learn that until you're one of these top castes. And so this is more for the lower caste that they do this because, you know, it's kind of an accommodation. Can the lower caste get knocked down to, right. to a plant, to poison ivy? Yes. Okay. If you get more... Unless you get the top caste, but it doesn't mean... No, if, you, if you're in the top caste and you still get more bad karma than good, you're getting knocked back down. Yeah, you're getting knocked back down. So it is still determined by how you live your life. And, but you never know until the end if you are going to be reincarnated. Exactly. Exactly. And it's all still an illusion, or then they know that it's not an illusion? No, it is an illusion. And, there, there's really, and that's the thing. Okay, here's where your mind gets blown and why I think, is this really something we all want to be shooting for? Ultimately, the goal of Hinduism is it's, it's to be Brahman. I can't say it's to be nothing, because wait till we get to Buddhism, but, but it's to realize that there is no you. There, Atman is Brahman. And so your, your, your eventual fate is there to be no individual you anymore. Just Brahman, you know. All right, speaking of Buddhism, 
Let's talk about Buddhism, our last one for the night. Now, Buddhism is an outgrowth of Hinduism, all right? And if I were to summarize the main point of Buddhism, it is the end goal is extinction. Anybody want to be a Buddhist? But you have to understand this, okay? We laugh because of our worldview. From their perspective and Hindu perspective, reincarnation is not a good thing. All right, we make it out in Hollywood to be this glorif. Oh, I wonder who I was in a past life, you know? It's not, because especially in Buddhism, life is synonymous with suffering. And so, by repeatedly going through life after life after life, that's like being sentenced to suffering after suffering after suffering. And so, their goal for both Hinduism and Buddhism, in slightly different ways, is release, to be released from that suffering. Hinduism says that release comes from acknowledging that there is no you, and it's just Brahman. And Buddhism says coming to the realization that there is no you, full stop. You know, you don't exist, um, essentially. Now, are there variations? Sure there are. Especially, we've, we've westernized a lot of these religions over here in the United States um, and, and changed a lot of them. But uh, primarily, we're talking about the, the original version of Buddhism, which is still prominent today. Um, the, the view of God. First of all, just so you know, Buddha is not a name, it's a title. So you refer to as the Buddha, all right? The Buddha is a title that's given to an Indian prince, I don't know his name, I don't know if anybody does, um, who supposedly lived between around 563 to 483 BC. And the problem he had is a problem a lot of people still have today, and I've taught many classes on it. How do you reconcile the existence of a loving God with so much pain and suffering in the world? That's what started Buddhism, all right? This prince had a hard time believing there could be a loving God or gods in polytheism because of all the pain and suffering that he saw in the world. So his solution was, see a God. He's going to come up with a religious system that has no gods in it whatsoever, all right? Now, the irony of it is some later versions of Buddhism turned around and actually worshipped the Buddha as a god, which is the exact opposite of what his point was. So it's kind of funny, but not, you know. But so he left his philosophy, it wasn't necessarily atheistic, all right? The Buddha didn't necessarily say there is no God, as much as he would say, if there is, God is completely irrelevant, has no bearing on how we live our lives or anything whatsoever. So it'd be meaningless if there is a God. All right. Are there divisions within Buddhism? Yes mostly geographically oriented, and the names, I don't have to write this in the board because I put, did put these on the slide, if you really care, all right, um, in different regions of the East, you saw different types of Buddhism. Uh, Theravada Buddhism is, I believe, the more southern, uh, southern regions, and that is the one that's more closely tied to the original teachings of the Buddha. But what the Buddha said was similar caste system in Buddhism, just like there is in Hinduism. And the Buddha said, look, the only people who can reasonably expect to achieve nirvana, it's nirvana in Buddhism as opposed to moksha, all right? The only people who can reasonably hope to achieve nirvana at the end of this life are the priests. If you're not in the highest caste, you are destined for at least another life, all right? A lot of people didn't like that, so there are branches off that came to Buddhism that allowed for, theoretically, anyone in some of the higher castes to achieve nirvana at the end of their life. You didn't have to be a priest. But Theravada Buddhism says, no, you got to be a priest, all right, in order to achieve nirvana. Um, okay, hold on a second. Sure. The end goal is extinction. You haven't gotten to that yet. I'll explain why that is. But, the, I mean, the, the summary, the, the basic gist of it is because you want to end this cycle of suffering after suffering. Look, think of it this way. Uh, the philosophy of Buddhism is a lot like the thinking of a lot of people who, comp who contemplate suicide. It's very similar ties, right? And it's, it's, there's not really any reflection on, you know, I, I say I want relief from my suffering. Well, but in order to experience relief, there has to be someone there that to experience it. And if there's no you to experience the relief, then there's no relief, all right? Um, which is one of the issues with Buddhism and, frankly, with the suicidal thoughts. But, of course, as somebody who's in that way of thinking, you're not going to sit there and let's have a rational discussion about whether this is a, a reasonable course of action. I am not advocating that, all right? Um, but from a rational perspective, yes, yeah, suicide as a form of relief doesn't make sense. Because if you kill yourself, who's the one experiencing the relief? 
I mean, you've got two options here. Either I'm right about Christianity, in which case, you know, you're either going to heaven or hell, depending on faith and all that, or I'm wrong about it, in which case you just cease to exist if you're a naturalist, and there's no one to experience the relief in the first place. Anyway, that's a side note. I won't go into that. All right, so the, we, we saw there are divisions. I, I kind of skipped, I'm sorry, the scripture authority because there really is no Buddhist Bible. That is not the same thing as saying there's no Buddhist scriptures. Sure there are, but there's no consensus. Like there, even Hinduism, remember I said, you have to adhere to the Vedas. Even that doesn't necessarily exist in Buddhism. These different divisions of Buddhism have different authoritative books that they will look to to help interpret what Buddhism means. So there's no like concrete, this, this is the Buddhist Bible kind of thing. All right. But Buddha, the Buddha does say life is suffering, reincarnation is repeated suffering. Reincarnation is a little bit different in Buddhism, though, because the Buddha says you don't actually really exist. It's not just that there's all this oneness. It's all illusion. You don't even exist. Don't get me started. Okay, well, then who is it that doesn't exist? You. Wait, what? You know, it, yeah. Um, a lot of contradictory issues with it, but you don't even exist. So reincarnation isn't even like your soul coming back in a next life. It's more just like the collection of your karma is being reconstituted into another life, if, if that makes sense. Um, so while it does believe in reincarnation, it's a little bit different than Hindu reincarnation in that regard. There's no Atman in, in Buddhism, all right? Um, all right, so here's the thing. So here's the goal. Our, our problem is suffering. What causes suffering? According to the Buddha, suffering is all caused by desire. You suffer because you want stuff, and you can't get it, and so you, you feel bad, and you suffer. All suffer is caused by desire. Or maybe it's caused because someone else desires something you have. All right? So the Buddha says, all suffering is caused by desire. <clears throat> Therefore, we need to eliminate desire. And if we eliminate desire, then you eliminate suffering, right? If you don't desire anything and desire is the root of all suffering, there's no suffering. Answer a question for me then. So does that mean we should be desiring to get rid of desiring? <laughs> Sorry, I'm interjecting a few of my thoughts about Buddhism here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a self-contradictory system. You start to see it here. There's a lot of logical problems with Buddhism, but it is what it is. All right, so the Buddha then says, here's how you get rid of suffering. And of course, there's always a pathway, right? So the first thing is, you have to acknowledge the four noble truths. That's what he called them, the four noble truths. What are the four noble truths? I won't write them down. We've kind of covered them already. Truth number one, life is full of suffering. You have to acknowledge that. Truth number two, suffering is caused by desire, by craving or desire. All right, that's what causes suffering. Truth number three, suffering can only stop when we get rid of that craving or desire. All right? And point, noble truth number four is the way you get rid of desire is by following the eightfold path. All right? There's always, yeah, there's always a, a mechanism, right? So what is the eightfold path? All right? Eight things you have to live your life according. And I'm not going to go through each one in detail, but each one is, we'll just say, right, and then I'll just put dot, 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 so I won't rewrite right every single time. All right? Right views. You have to have the right thinking. You have to have the right beliefs. All right? Right aspiration. Which, last I checked, was a synonym for desire, but we won't go there. All right. Right speech. Watch what you say. Okay? Right conduct. Be good. Right livelihood. Don't be a prostitute, uh, to give you an example, but yeah. Um, right effort. Right mindfulness. And right contemplation. And if you do all these things, you cease to exist. And that's what you want. I know, but you're thinking of it like a rational human being. No. Uh, yes. The idea is similar to Hinduism. You, th you do all these things, and then, again, because there's really no you to begin with, your karma gets reconstituted as a higher life on the caste system for the next life until eventually 
You, you become a priest according to Theravada Buddhism because you've got to be that highest caste to achieve nirvana. And this is another one of those terms. How many of you realize nirvana meant you stop existing? Nope. nope. It's a great band. But do they exist anymore? They achieve nirvana. <laughs> we think, right, it means heaven, something pleasant, you know, something great. No, Buddhism, it, nirvana is the ultimate goal and it means you're done. See ya. You finally start to realize it. But it's seen as relief. All right? Relief from this never-ending cycle of suffering. Now, understand something about the way karma works, folks. There is no personal God. It's not like there is a, a divine God who's adding up good karma and bad karma. It's almost like an automatic machine that's just inherent in the operation of the universe. What universe? I don't know, because Buddhism says nothing's really existing. So there is no universe. Sorry. Okay. You can see it's filled with logical contradictions. Um, but I will tell you, um, and I'll close on this, a, uh, a story that was um, told by uh, the late Ravi Zacharias, who obviously had a lot of very personal failings, but the story still holds true. He was invited to speak at a uh, university classroom from somebody who taught some of these Eastern religions, so taught like Hinduism and Buddhism. And, um, and the the professor invited him to come speak. He asked him to come speak on why he's not religion X, probably why he's not a Hindu or why he's not Buddhism. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to attack the other religion. But I will tell you what I'll do. I will come and I'll explain to you why I am a Christian. In the course of me explaining that, implicit in that will be some reasons why I don't follow religion X. You've heard the story, haven't you, Tom? You're smiling back there. And so um, he comes up and he gives his speech. And then the, uh, the professor afterwards says, um, uh, you, just come, you don't understand what you're talking about. That was the worst speech, basically the worst lecture I've ever heard. And so Ravi Zacharias turns to him and says, tell you what, we're not, I'm not going to sit here and argue with you in front of the students because nothing's gained by that. We're all just trying to look good in front of other people. How about we go to lunch? And the way he described it is, you pay and I'll pray. Um, and we'll talk about it over lunch. So they go to lunch. And this, this professor of the Eastern, this Eastern way of thinking uh, pulls out all his napkins and charts. And he's writing on the back of his tablecloth. And he's been this whole argument where he's basically saying, you know, your problem, uh, Mr. Zacharias, is you're thinking of either or. You're thinking of ever, the truth is like either this is true or that is true. All right. Um, but that is a Western way of thinking. And Ravi Zacharias is like, no, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Whatever. Move on. Um, and so then he says, but in the East, we think of things as both and. So and that is an Eastern way of thinking. And Ravi Zacharias is like, no, no, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Whatever. They, 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 so fine, go on. And so he said, Mr. Zacharias, when you see these contradictions, alleged contradictions, like all the things I've been pointing out tonight, all right, is that's because you're thinking like a Westerner. You're thinking that everything must be either or. But in the East, we think of things as both and. So both this can be true and that can be true. And these contradictions disappear. And so after he spells out his whole argument, Ravi Zacharias finally gets a chance to speak. And he says, let me see if I understand this straight. You're saying that when I'm evaluating your Eastern religion, I either have to use your way of thinking or nothing else. Is that correct? <laughs> Took the guy to think about it and he realized, oh yeah. And he said, I got news for you. Even, even in India, we look both ways before we cross the street. It is either the bus or me, not both of us. <laughs> All right. And so we all use this either or way of thinking, but these Eastern religions try to pretend like that's not an issue. They try to pretend like you can have mutually contradictory beliefs, but to even argue for that is to use an either or way of thinking. And so that's kind of where they fall apart. All right. Um, thank you. For, I know that was a lot of talking tonight and not as much Bible study because we weren't specifically talking about Christianity. Next week, we'll dive more into the Christian scriptures when we're going to be talking about abortion. Yay! I got a week off from being lambasted online, and then next week it'll all start again. I say that. Somebody's probably going to lambaste me for this one, too. So. Someone's not going to like what I said. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Let's pray. Can we pray real quick before we leave? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I love the opportunity to come up here and share these truths. Thank you for everybody who's come here today. We ask, I ask, Lord, more than anything else, that through these lessons, especially tonight, 
that you use them to strengthen the faith in all of our hearts. We know you've already placed it there, Lord, but we can see what happens in the type of belief systems that come about when people don't accept your truth. And so, Lord, we thank you for giving us faith, and we thank you for hopefully opening our eyes so we can see, we, we can have that extra assurance that, yes, your way is the only way. You are the truth, Lord, and frankly, your way is the only way that makes sense. We pray you be with us as we leave this place tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>